Good afternoon, and welcome to today's IABC Heritage Region webinar, Engaging Your Audience with Real Life Stories, Vibrant Examples from Civic Storytelling. I'm Greg McCormick, and I'm the Communications Chair of the IABC Heritage Region. We've enjoyed bringing you monthly webinars focused on trends and best practices in the communication profession. This month, you can look forward to firsthand insights on civic storytelling and best practices you can apply in your own organizations. In a few moments, we'll connect you to a live interview that Heather Gunther, President of IABC Detroit, will conduct with Aaron Foley, Detroit's first chief storyteller. In an era when fewer journalists cover local neighborhoods, municipalities are using unique approaches to illuminate the stories that make their communities vibrant places to be. In his role as chief storyteller, Aaron has made groundbreaking efforts to engage a diverse group of voices and discuss events that don't normally get covered by the city's traditional media. Drawing on her journalistic roots, Heather will chat with Aaron to explore this work, the challenges, successes, next steps, and lessons all of us can apply in the communications profession. A Detroit native, Aaron leads a team of writers and photographers and videographers in creating stories for and about Detroit, all shared by a website called The Neighborhoods and a city-owned cable TV channel. Previously, Aaron was editor of Black Detroit Magazine and held positions at Ward's Automotive Group, M Live, and the Lansing State Journal. Before we start the interview, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. I'd like to introduce Amy Miller, Region Finance Chair, and our tech associate for this webinar. Amy will review a few quick points to help you gain the most from this experience. Thank you, Greg. Everyone, if you would like to watch the interview in full screen mode, then mouse to the top right of your screen, you should see uh, four little arrows and just click on that to enter full screen mode or exit full screen mode. That's at the top right of your screen, just mouse up there, you should see it. During the interview, if you'd like to send us a comment or question for discussion afterwards, please use the chat button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Just mouse down to the bottom of your screen and your toolbar will appear, including the chat button. If any of you have joined with others watching in this room using a single connection, that's great. If that's your situation, we ask that you kindly let us know how many are at your location using the chat tool, just for our records. After the interview, Greg will moderate a brief opportunity for Aaron to answer attendee questions that came in via the chat. And we may also have time for live questions. We also received questions in advance from some of you when you registered, so thank you. If you'd like to join the conversation later, right now we're showing some questions that may spur ideas for you. Also, today's webinar is being recorded. As a registered attendee, you will receive the following. A link to our very brief survey as you leave the webinar. Please take a moment to respond so we can keep making improvements. Also get an email with a link taking you to the recording of this webinar, as well as slides, and a link to register for our July webinar. And Thank you, Amy. One more quick note. Today's webinar may also whet your appetite for a visit to Detroit. This year, our regional conference will take place in the Motor City, September 22nd to 24th. You can register at iabcheritageconference.com. Now, let's get started. Let's connect to the Heather Gunther's interview with Aaron Foley. Thanks so much, Greg, and welcome to all of you on the other side of the screen. As Greg mentioned, my name is Heather Gunther, and for a few more days at least, I'm president of IBC's Detroit chapter. It's great to meet so many of you electronically. I see we're up to 80, that's phenomenal. Uh, but I also hope to get to meet you all in person in Detroit this September at the Heritage Region Conference. Now, this regional webinar series that you've joined today uh, is known for bringing you wisdom from communication industry experts. But today, we're giving it to you with a little bit of a twist, a sneak peek at this upcoming Heritage Region Conference. And that's because I am joined today by one of our conference keynoters, Mr. Aaron Foley, a former uh, journalist and a Detroit native. Thanks so much for joining us today, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, brother. 
So Erin, in 2017, you became the first person that we know of in U.S. local government to hold the title of Chief Storyteller. In Detroit, you head up the Department of Storytelling, an entirely new department to match your new role. So, what do you do? Do you replace a traditional communications director? Do you replace and or overlap with a chief marketer? Help us understand how you see your role and all of its responsibilities fitting within the existing marketing communications ecosystem. Right, so um, in, our, in our city government, we have our communications office that communicates directly with the press and the media and handles inquiries from reporters and journalists and so on and so forth. And then we have our de department of media services. Um, every city has a public access channel um, and you need people to staff that channel, videographers, audio visual tech. That's what we do in department of media services. And that's the department I work in. Um, I work alongside videographers, uh, audio visual techs, photographers, um, and our people that print, uh, uh, you know, booklets and flyers and things like that. Um, I, we, work, we work closely with the communications office, but because they dialogue directly with the media, we handle stuff um, directly with uh, residents and neighbors. Um, so when I came along, I, I asked for a budget to hire um, two additional writers. Um, two additional videographers that will work directly with me and a photographer. And we go out and document life in Detroit. Um, public access television is where a lot of our videos go, but we were missing the digital component of a, of a site or something where people could go every day and find out something new about Detroit. Um, the types of things that we cover, uh, very little of it, um, very little of, of our coverage has to do with something that our communications office puts out. So they'll put out a lot of press releases about like street closers and, 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 and trash pickup and stuff like that. We won't really touch those. We just wanna show what Detroit looks like um, and do it in a new kind of way that a city government hasn't done before. We do a lot of photo galleries. We've done an actual photo exhibit where people can go see it. Um, some of the headlines we've done is uh, we did, we look for the types of stories that don't always, would, wouldn't go on page one or, or lead the five o'clock news. We've done stories about a family owned three generation car wash. We've done stories about uh, a, a roller rink, which is one of the oldest roller rinks in the country. And, but when we went to interview the owners who another third generation uh, of family business there, uh, he said, nobody's ever written about us. And so we, we keep finding and stumbling over all these up and coming entrepreneurs, all these mom and pop shops, to residents and neighbors who are doing uh, interesting things around town. Uh, those are the types of things that we go after. And uh, so far it's been working well for us. So your office tells stories about Detroit. As you mentioned in your, your previous answer, the media, national, international, mm -hmm. certainly local, also tell stories about Detroit. Yeah. You touched on this a little bit about the differences between those types of stories being told by the media and being told by your office. I'm very interested in how does this differ, the stories you're telling, how do they differ from how Detroit used to communicate about its people and to its people? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of places telling stories about Detroit. And we as city government, we don't want to replace or supplant uh, any, any outlet that uh, uh, wants to tell Detroit's story that, you know, a city government or any sort of government doing that, that's, that's territory we, we definitely don't want to walk into there. But, um, but we do see, you know, we, we see an opportunity, and especially um, a lot of um, corporate organizations that are thinking about this. Um, if, if you're part of us, if you're part of something that, you know, only one part of the story is being told. Um, me being a Detroit native, a lot of our narrative centers around bankruptcy and the automotive industry and, and sports. Um, these are all parts of Detroit story. Nobody's denying that. But a lot of residents are, you know, myself included, were just like, well, you know, you've got all these businesses that never get attention. You've got all these different places outside of our downtown region uh, that don't get a lot of attention. What are the things that some organizations do, be it government, nonprofit, or corporate, or whatever? Now, it doesn't necessarily function or act as a newsroom, you know, are not traditional journalism outlets, but what can they do to t tell those stories um, in a way to get a message out there, get a narrative out there um, that 
that you know people it's a place where people can see themselves it's definitely a place where residents can say like oh i feel acknowledged i feel like i matter because my name or my business or whatever made into a headline um but that's uh you know that's where we try to fill in those gaps you know many years ago uh, local newspapers used to have full-on community sections, like stuff right into the middle of the paper. You know, you had your sports section, your business section, you might have like a tabloid or some other uh, community news section section that reported on the kinds of things that, you know, it wasn't, you know, blood and crime and guts and things like that. Um, but just sort of interesting things going on in the neighborhood. Um, journalism organizations are smaller now. You don't have those same kind of staffs or reporters uh, with that same kind of capability to cover an, a, an ongoing court case and also cover, you know, a knitting class or, or, or something like that. We kind of laugh at knitting classes and, and those everyday community things, but um, they, they're they important to people. And, you know, we see the importance of covering the things and writing about the things that are important to people. So this brings up an interesting point, interesting question, because you once were the media. Yeah. As we heard earlier in your very impressive bio, you know, you were previously an editor at a local lifestyle magazine. You've reported nationally, locally. You also grew up in Detroit. You spent enough time on both sides to form a favorite. We're not going to get into that here, but for all you overachievers, we give you the answers, so make sure you check out the slides afterward. Um, Aaron, how have your experiences as an editor and a reporter, but also as a Detroiter, shaped your approach to shaping the Department of Storytelling's narrative? Well, I mean, like you said earlier, there's a lot of national and international places writing about Detroit, but um, no one knows Detroit better than a Detroiter. And so I, me and my team and everyone I work with, um, sort of have an eye for what we find interesting to us, but we, what we also find important to the community uh, that we serve. So being on the lookout for those types of things is where we, where we shine and where we, where we have an advantage. Too often, a lot of people come into Detroit and kind of tell the same story over and over and over again, you know, uh, for example, like a queue line or, or what's going on downtown or Little Caesars Arena, you know, this is, new, it may be new to their audiences, but, you know, Detroiters, we consume a lot of media about our own city and like after a while you start to see like the same repetitive things over and over again. Like I said, I'm not trying to stop them from doing their job, they have a job to do, but you know, it, the question that always comes up to me and the people I work with and my superiors and whatnot is, well, what about us? What about the neighborhoods? Uh, which is why we call our platform the neighborhoods because we wanted it to be the answer to that question. But, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, that's definitely, you know, I, I feel as a Detroiter, um, I'm passionate about my city. I love my city uh, more than anything, but I wanna see like all parts of my city uh, being recognized. Um, our different minority communities, our different uh, religious uh, communities, our LGBT community is Pride Month right now. Um, all, all of these different uh, things, interesting things that, that make Detroit home. So I think for me, certainly sitting in this room with you, hopefully all of those of you joining us uh, virtually, your passion for this city and for its people is clear. And I'm picking up on a, a common thread in some of your answers, the importance of capturing and sharing authentic stories, right. stories that showcase the passion uh, and the resiliency of the people of Detroit, uh, but stories that don't always meet, fit neatly into pre-existing and frankly dominant narratives about our city. Right. You're also a city employee. Yeah. So how much editorial independence do you have? We actually have a very long leash from uh, the mayor and, 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 and city council. Um, one, one thing that we made clear uh, that when I first started this position was, you know, I didn't want to be in a position, and certainly the mayor or chief of staff don't want to be in this position because there's so many different things going on in the city, right? I'm trusted uh, with this role to not have to go knock on anybody's door and get like clearance or approval for anything. So. I've never had to go up upstairs, you know, we're on the third floor, mayor's on 11. You know, I've mean, never had to go upstairs and like, ask to be like, hey mayor, like, can you approve this? Um, nor like on the flip side, like they don't come downstairs and like sit in in our meetings or anything like that. Um, the goal here is very, very simple. Um, I mean, it's a complex way of reaching the goal, obviously, but the goal here is um, we want to show that Detroit is welcoming to everybody. 
is um, worthy to everybody. And we want to show that Detroiters are worthy of being spotlighted. They're worthy of a media platform. Um, and we all know at every level, be it on our level, on where we are, or up, upstairs in the mayor's office, we all know that the well of stories will never run, run dry. And so there's hardly any, you know, way of like, you know, stumbling on something that um, may not go over well, I guess, because it's like, okay, why would you write about that when you could write about all of these other different things that, uh, that these people are doing that uh, people think are important to them? And if they think it's important to them as they're being a Detroiter, then we, sh we should acknowledge that as Detroit city government. So you're about mm, a year and a half, two years into the office. How are you and if he is involved in this measurement, the Detroit city mayor, Mike Duggan, yeah. measuring the success and the impact of the Department of Storytelling? One thing the mayor told me from the very beginning is that when he goes to a community meeting or goes out in the public and he asks if you've heard of the neighborhood site or if you've seen some of the stories that the city is telling, um, if he hears about it, then um, he'll know that it's permeated the consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the first you know, year or so, um, building, building this kind of thing from the ground up and, and getting, you know, there's so, many, so much competition for views and eyeballs and, and traffic and whatnot because there's a lot of new publications in Detroit right now. A lot of cat videos too out there. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of viral videos and so many ways to distribute it, Twitter and Nextdoor and Facebook and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of competition or I, and I don't compete, honestly. And, you know, like I don't want to get into like a, a feud or a blood world, world war for you know ten thousand patriots or something like that. Um, but you know, there is a lot of people trying to get Detroit's attention right now. And um, for the first year that we did that, you know, it was very hit or miss. Um, the mayor would go out in places and ask about, you know, have you heard of the neighborhood site? And a lot of people would say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, now, two years later, um, he's starting to hear it more, he, you know, and so that's, that was his goal for me as far as um, in, in my team uh, to have people know that this thing exists in the city. My, um, my personal measure of success is um, I wanted somebody to read a story on the neighborhood site or see one of our videos. And, and have their perception about Detroit changed as a result. How that perception changes is what they do after they see the story. They either might just change their opinion about Detroit or they'll actually invest in Detroit. So last year um, for Pride Month, uh, we did a, a series of stories about um, um, LGBT residents in the city. Just everyday people, you know, not trying to like put them on sort of this, you know, brave pedestal, like oh, you're so brave to move to Detroit, and, you know, or whatever. You know, these are just ordinary gay couples and lesbian couples living their lives in the city or, or lesbian spaces. We did one, a story about, you know, safe space where uh, lesbian Detroiters could, could gather and, and feel you know, community and whatnot. Well, this year when we started looking for more Pride Month stories, uh, we had a couple that said, um, we read the series last year and we were inspired to buy a house in the city of Detroit um, because we didn't know that there was an LGBT community that existed here. Um, what does this do for, for us as city government? Well, you've got people seeing the content that we're putting out and it's a public service if, if not only are we making people feel seen in our city, but we've also spurred some investment. We've, we've spurred a new resident to come to the city, which is one of the mayor's, uh, you know, goals, but also something all of us should feel, you know, something we should be striving for regardless of if, it, if it's government, government or not, because Detroit needs all the residents they can get. But we want people to see that, um, you know, you can feel a part of Detroit because of the people that live here. It's, it all keeps coming back to the people, the residents, the neighbors. Um, we're a function of city government that recognizes those people. Um, when people think of city government, they typically think of like the more municipal side, the street lights and, and trash pickup and, and, and uh, uh, power lines and, and, and public works and things like that. This is a very people focused, you know, this is a part of government that, um, you know, has a much deeper interaction with actual residents than than you know your garbage person waving at you as they yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> well that's 
That's also very fascinating. You touched on this a little bit about the impact, you know, quantitative. I think many of us are familiar with, you know, there's page views, there's retweets, yeah, yeah. and there's likes. I think the example you just gave is uh, a great way, you know, a great kind of the putting it up on a pedestal, not, not to do that. However, <laughs> that great qualitative type of story that clearly shows a common thread between what we're doing as communicators and what we're hoping to impact in our roles as communicators. Do you have any mechanisms set up to capture more of those type of stories, more of those uh, perception changing mm -hmm. uh, moments? Um, well, yeah, we do. I mean, we do have the quantitative as far as uh, Google Analytics, seeing what kind of stories work for us, seeing, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to promote and, 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 and we actually don't spend a lot of ad uh, spend on, you know, promoted posts on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. Um, but that's something we're still like internally trying to figure out. It's just like, okay, if we are going to do it, where should we spend it? Mm -hmm. This is something I'm not, you know, I'm not sure any city government is having these sorts of conversations as far as, you know, if you, you're producing content, um, because very few are producing content like we do. And then also trying to figure out like, okay, what's the best way to promote it so that it reaches as many eyes as possible. But yeah, we do um, month to month, I track pack page views. I see what kind of stories work. I see what doesn't. I look at the listens on our podcast. I look at the views on, uh, you know, uploading a, a Facebook video versus YouTube and stuff like that. We still haven't figured out, you know, for our cable channels getting Nielsen ratings, mm -hmm. but we know people are watching the cable channel because if some, like, if there's like a sound issue or something like that, the phones in her department <laughs> light up. So we, you know, we know we're engaging with an audience, um, but. Uh, so, uh, some of the other parts of how we how we gather stories, I guess, um, is uh, we have an inbox. People can drop us a line or whatever. Um, a lot of city employees that we work with in different departments, they're on the ground with a lot of this stuff. And so it's up to them to kind of also have an eye for what's interesting and so that they can pass that along to us. Um, when I think about like how, you know, you can or incorporate this at, at the corporate level, um, Nobody knows your corporation more than the people that work there. And the people that work in your organization have probably had some level of customer service experience um, as far as dealing with whoever you're serving, your client, your customer, or whatever. Um, that's an opportunity for them to kind of pitch to whoever is in charge of blasting out content to say like, oh, hey, we had a great experience with this client. We had this or because of the investment we made here in this community or because of um, this product that we have, um, someone is, someone else is benefiting from this. You know, that's, you know, you, you're, you need that kind of network of people in your organization to be on the lookout for like, how is your, how, you know, what kind of impacts is your organization having beyond just the day to day? I love this model that you kind of described just here about using your employees to generate story ideas. Uh, how, you're, but you're a new department. So how have you raised awareness among the many city employees throughout yeah. the city of Detroit? And how successful, how many folks are sharing ideas with you and saying, you know what, when I was doing trash pickup, there's this lovely woman I always conversed with. She would be a great person for you to spotlight. Mm -hmm. How much is that, you know, the aspirational versus the actual practical, it's, it's happening, you're getting those ideas. It happens a lot. Um, some people are better than others, and I, and I don't want to say that some people are worse, but um, you and I having a journalism background, um, we can spot a story a lot better than people who don't have that same kind of eye for what's interesting. Um, a lot of city employees you know, are very humble about their jobs, and they, they can do something extraordinary for someone or, 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 or they see something that's extraordinary in our eyes, but they see it as just their day-to-day -day thing, right? So, you know, they, they see it, you know, a, you know, rescuing a dog from a tree or something like that. It's just routine, like part of the job type of stuff. Um, when, when, if I were looking at that, I would, I, I would be like, okay, how did that dog get in the tree? Like, how did this, how did this? All the questions that a journalist would, uh, would ask, um, so that that sort of you know learning curve as far as training people to have an eye for what's interesting, what's extraordinary has been has been a, a challenge for us. But on the on the other side, though, you know, we do get a lot of you know how do I do it? I guess I um, 
walking through the hallway, people would be like, oh, hey, Aaron, you know, like I got this or whatever. Um, email, email is king <laughs> for, <laughs> for our organization. Um, I go to a lot of community meetings um, through a lot of city different departments have, you know, planning has meetings, housing has meetings. All city departments have some sort of meeting and that's where the residents show up and I just kind of sit back and listen and see where people are at and kind of like be on the lookout for like, oh, she looks interesting, he looks interesting, so yeah. You mentioned earlier that in our type of work, I think any organization, certainly in the city, but again, any organization, the story well will never run dry before we have a chance to tell all those stories. Yeah. How much, how many stories are you, is your team producing in a week, in a month? You know, what's the right balance for all these other duties you're doing versus actual external publishing of mm -hmm. content? We try to, so my, my measuring stick is at least one post a day. Um, which is um, a little bit daunting for our, the size of our staff, but um, what can a post entail? Can it have a photo gallery from an event that our photographer went to over the weekend? Can it be a podcast that we recorded earlier in the month and we've been sitting on it, which was exactly what we did today, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that, uh, that people can listen to? Or is it just a post about, you know, um, you know I did an interview or someone else on my team did an interview? Um, we, po we are, one of our, um, main ways of communicating with people, I have to say is on the Nextdoor app, because that's where a lot, you, part of this, part of this for any organization is finding where your readers or your viewers or, or your customers in some cases, where they are. A lot of Detroiters are on that Nextdoor app. And I know Nextdoor sometimes gets like a, you know, like a bad rap for like, you know, watching like drama or whatever, and people <laughs> asking stupid questions, but it's increasingly where a lot of these traders are going to find information because our city uses it really well. Um, our parks director posts stuff from the parks department, but I post stuff from uh, uh, from the from the storytelling. And uh, I sometimes I'll ask a question, like a poll or something like that, and we'll just gather those answers and then turn it into another post. <laughs> you know, like today, yesterday, I asked. You know, we did a story about the Senior Olympics last week, for example. And again, Senior Olympics is not the page one, you know, breaking news story that, you know, all caps breaking news, Senior Olympics, like you'll never see that. But again, hundreds of Detroiters participate in that every year. Um, a deeper story beyond that is why they did it. So my intern went out, interviewed a bunch of seniors. Um, we put the Senior Olympics story out there. When, when I posted it to Nextor, I asked like, hey, are you a senior in Detroit? How do you use Google every day. And that's one of those things that's important. It, I see it as a public service again, because we're talking about health. We're talking about a, a very uh, sometimes neglected community in Detroit. Um, you know, sometimes seniors don't feel like they're recognized all the time. Um, and also Detroit also ends up on a lot of these lists as far as most unhealthy, you know, fattest city in, in the country and stuff like that. So anyway, we, so I'm going to take that, that, feedback I got from seniors about, you know, someone like, I do yoga, someone like, I, do, I ride my bike, and just keep putting it out there as far as like, okay, these seniors can do it, now you can do it, so. Let's talk a moment about perception. So I grew up downriver, and for those of our viewers not familiar with the term, let me pull out my map here. It is the mitten. <laughs> Uh, Down River is a collection of about 20 communities just south of Detroit. I might have a little bit of Monroe in that. Don't worry about that. Uh, so I am admittedly from an outsider's perspective of Detroit. Um, but in my limited experience, it seems that as I've grown up just outside the city limits, I've seen a shift in how suburbanites interact with Detroit. Mm -hmm. Growing up, it seemed very much that folks would travel to Detroit for very brief, very specific reasons, such as a sporting event when we were good and many things. Yeah. Rebuilding year, we'll be back soon, guys. Uh, but now it seems that Detroit has really morphed into this multi-day entertainment uh, destination. Mm -hmm. From an insider's perspective, what do we outsiders get wrong about mm -hmm. Detroit? And also how has Detroit, both those external perceptions, but also its reality mm -hmm. evolved since you were a kid until now? Yeah, um, I think one of the perceptions that a lot of people get Detroit about, get wrong about Detroit is uh, that the only life that exists is downtown in Midtown. And there's definitely, there, I mean, there's definitely, you know, and there's reasons for that. Um, all of the sports stadiums now, now we have all four teams. Mm -hmm. 
playing. Uh, uh, we're, we're like one of the only cities in the country that has like all four major sports in, in one place. Uh, all of them are downtown. Uh, um, uh, all of the, not all of the nightlife, but like a good amount of nightlife is downtown. A good amount of the stores, the, the national stores that are, are, are coming into Detroit, they all relocate downtown. Um, and you would think, but Detroit has always had that um, perception of like, like violence and murder capital and stuff like that. That still carries into today where you have people who go on like Reddit or Facebook or something like that. And they say like, well, don't go outside downtown. There's nothing for you outside downtown. Well, Detroit is a city with 680,000 people in it. All of them don't live downtown. Who, who you know, where, 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 where are they? You know, where's the rest of them? Um, getting people to understand that there's life outside of downtown has been the, the biggest perception challenge that we've had. Um, there is retail and shopping outside of downtown. There are people who, you know, take care of their neighborhoods and take care of their blocks downtown. There are, you know, people who go to work and, and keep their kids in school every day outside of downtown and have just like a regular um, life, I guess. Um, buying a home, you know, you know, or renting, you can do that outside of downtown. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, there, there are certainly, you know, and this is not to say that like, you know, everything is hunky dory across the city of Detroit. There are certainly neighborhoods and areas that have many, many challenges. But that's always been the long time challenge as a native Detroiter. Is like, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where we had stores and we had, you know, like the basic necess necess necessities of life. And just because we were in Detroit didn't mean like we had any less. You know, like I, I went to a really good school. My classmates all went to good schools. You know, we all went to Michigan State or UVM um, after college. And 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 you would think that like, um, you know, that this kind of that weird, like there's Detroit and then there's Michigan mm. type, type of thing. And, and we didn't think twice about it growing up in Detroit. It was like, we're, it's Detroit comma Michigan for us. Like we're Michigan people, but like you get to, you know, interact with people outside of Detroit and you always get that, oh, you're from Detroit. Like, <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, oh, okay. So yeah, um, but now I think we're reaching that point now where, um, you don't get the uh, you're from Detroit anymore. Now it's like, oh, you're from Detroit. You know, like how it must be fun to live downtown. It's just like, well, I don't live downtown, but I'm still having a great time yeah. in the city. So, and all of you can come and see for yourself uh, September 22nd through 24th. Quick plug and also hear from Aaron. Uh, for those listening in, Aaron and that are thinking, oh, wow, I really need to create a department of storytelling in my own organization. What type of tips and advice do you have for those of us that would be building this enterprise from the ground up? What type of resources do we need? How did you go about building a budget? Yeah. And maybe a step back even further, what should we communicators be looking at? What factors should we be evaluating to understand whether such a department is the right fit for our organization and our culture? For us, we found a source of funding that um, was being underutilized. Um, and so if you do have a source of funding that, um, you know, if you have some extra revenue somewhere um, um, that could be used towards building any kind of department, really. But for, um, for us, so I mentioned very earlier on, you know, I work in the department that produces public access television. Um, public access is on cable. Um, cable companies in every city, not just Detroit, but literally any city in across the country in the U.S., cable and internet companies have to pay a fee uh, to be present in your community. So if you live in West Bloomfield, West Bloomfield for example, um, suburb of Detroit, they've got a very active public access department. Well, Comcast, Verizon, Charter Communications, Time Warner, uh, all, all of these um, different community uh, cable uh, companies, uh, they run wires either above ground or, or underground, and you have to pay the city an annual fee to do, to do that. Um, those fees go directly towards public access departments in, in, in the city of Detroit. Uh, was collecting a lot of fees because we're a bigger city and we got a lot of wires running around this town. Uh, and so it's used to cover salary, production costs, equipment, and things like that. We had some revenue from the, that uh, funding stream that uh, was just being banked year after year after year. And um, while it was definitely covering, you know, everybody else that had already worked there, you know, somebody looked at the budget for us and they're just like, oh, you know, we can actually hire more people. And that's how I came in. Um, 
the kind of skills that um, any organization should be looking for is like who's passion who's passionate about your company, who's passionate about your organization, who can understand how to tell your organization's story in a way that other people can digest it. One thing about me and my team is that because we understand Detroit, because we're products of Detroit, we know how to speak directly to Detroiters. Um, you know, walk the walk and talk to talk is how I like to say it. Um, but, uh, you know, someone who's got a background in content production, it doesn't necessarily have to be journalism either. You know, you and I, like I said, you and I have the journalism background, but um, so many more people are getting like journalism adjacent mm -hmm. degrees now, mm -hmm. you know, like digital media and stuff like that. Um, who can write? Who's got an eye? Um, having the eye and the instinct is, is important uh, above all, but like who can write, who can photograph, who can translate, you know, your corporate message, the gobbledygook sometimes, because this is something I deal with with some city departments. You know, they speak the language of as if they're still in the building. You need someone that can translate that language to project it outward outside so that people understand. Um, finding, finding people um, to build that department with those sorts of skills um, and who's going to be excited to tell your story. There has to be a level of like personal like emotion attached, attached to this. I'm excited to tell Detroit's story, but um, you know, you just hire someone that just isn't excited about it and just, you know, it's, it's going to show in the content they produce. Um, so because we're excited to do this, because we have an attachment to this, a personal investment into it, um, the videos are clean, the, the passion is there, it, it's evident in, in, in the content that we produce. So your role benefited from executive support from its onset. From what I recall, what I understand, Mayor Mike Duggan had had this idea, kind of bouncing around for a while before he approached you. Mm -hmm. For those of us that are looking to kind of be our own startup uh, initiative and create this, what recommendations do you have? How do we build that all-important executive support for something like this? Um, to build executive support is you've got to have an ROI that says, um, you know, what is, by investing in this, your return will be um, having a say in, in your narrative. Um, for a long time, Detroit did not have it, it, well, it felt like Detroit did not have a, a say in its own story. And I'm not talking about like city government not having a say in their own story. I'm just talking about like Detroit period. Um, because we had so many like ongoing like, you know, bankruptcy, the automotive industry fallout, you know, all, all those types of things going on. Um, if a lot of people were just like, okay, when does this tide ever turn? And so that's part of my mission is like, okay, I want to help keep moving this tide in the other direction. So um, we do do these stories about the everyday average trader. Um, from a corporate standpoint is, okay, how do people perceive you? How do, how do your customers, how do your clients look at you? If there's something missing that, they, that you want them to know, then that's your opportunity to hire someone or bring someone on board that can help expand that message. You know, what is your narrative? Do you own your narrative? And if you don't own it, like how do you hire someone that can like help you take, take that back, right? So I wanna be cognizant of the time and I actually see the chat button lighting up with a lot of questions. So I'm going to turn the conversation over to Greg. You're not off the hook quite yet, Eric. So we're, we're gonna enter into your Q&A session. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I've got a couple questions that have come in from the chat. The first one, Aaron, is how big is your staff and is it volunteer or no, do all, you hire? No, it's all uh, paid. Uh, no one volunteers for the city. <laughs> I, we'd probably be violating some sort of rule. Um, so the department I work in is 34 people, but not all of them are, are, are telling stories. Um, I manage a team of five that directly supports this initiative. So. Um, it's me, two videographers, two writers. Um, one of our writers doubles as an audio engineer, so she does our podcasting, and uh, a photographer. Now, one thing we're starting to do, I'll say this, is that because we do have a bunch of other people on staff but who primarily do meetings and press conferences and stuff like that, we're trying to do it so that we integrate uh, some of the side projects that they do 
uh, a lot of the videographers, when they have time, they'll go out and do some some neighborhood reporting or, or do some neighborhood video. Um, but it goes on on another on another uh, channel that we have. So trying to integrate the two teams so that you know the city council meetings go on one place, but the side stuff that they're doing comes to us at the neighborhoods. Um, that's something that we're working on right now. But yeah, for now, a team of five, uh, maybe. If, if all goes to plan, like we'll be like this full, like 30 plus strong. Like, <laughs> okay, it's a perfect segue to the next question. How do you select and vet your potential story subject? Um, it, that's where the journalism background comes in as far as being able to sense like, okay, does this person just wanna promote their business? Um, and, and get a free headline? Or is this truly an unrecognized uh, story that needs to be told? Um, we, we're pretty good at that. Like our sensors are, are pretty good at, um, you know, sifting through that distinction. But vetting a story, you know, this, there's training that comes with this, researching your subject, um, making sure that uh, everything they say lines up. Uh, you know, if they say a number, you've got you to ask them for a receipt or ask them for, um, you, to back it up somehow. Um, everybody's got a, some sort of background in journalism or some sort of media background that we work with. And so that's how we vet people. We, we vet people the same way as a journalist would for a TV station or a, or a newspaper. Um, and we just, so far, not going to live, we haven't had a situation where we had to like delete anything or anything like that. I've seen it happen. Uh, but um, no, I mean, we, we've got to have that, that background. Okay, and then here's a sort of related follow up. Um, you mentioned posting once a day is your goal. Do you find yourself sometimes having to repurpose content from other outlets or even from your archives? No, uh, we, I have a strict, no, like aggregating, no repurposing from anybody else. Um, now that said, um, you mentioned, uh, sharing our older content when we were building our audience in the beginning, you know, we didn't have as many Twitter followers as we do now. So we had a lot of good stuff that went unrecognized, but it's evergreen. Uh, so yeah, we'll dig into archives every once in a while and like pull out an older story that like when we had like a hundred Twitter followers, um, you know, only that small amount of people watched it. Um, but then we'll put it back out there um, and, 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 and get more, more attention to it. Okay, um, just for someone who was a, a late starter to the conference or the, to the call today, what was your, the genesis for the department? Was it the mayor's idea to create the storytelling department? Yeah, it was the mayor's idea. He had something similar uh, not exactly a chief storyteller, but the ma our mayor used to be a chief executive of a medical system here. Um, and he had, a, you know, and now in, in, interestingly enough, the person who was kind of in a similar role at the hospital system now works at the city. <laughs> she came over a little bit later. But um, no, there was, there was a similar idea going on at the medical system where it's like they needed some more information about them out there that they couldn't get through in, in a more traditional way. Um, so they had this whole campaign to do it and he brought that a, a little bit of that, um, that uh, campaign idea to uh, what I do now. Okay. So let me go, this is, uh, gets back to the ROI question. Uh, regarding Google Analytics, do you use a free or paid service? We use a free service. We do a lot. We try not to do spend a whole lot on, I mean, there's probably going to reach a point where if we keep growing, uh, we're, we're going to have to start paying for, you know, upgraded software and upgraded apps and things like that. But no, right now we're just using it, the, the basic uh, Google Analytics. Okay. Then there's just another question too about how you got started from a budgeting and funding standpoint. You mentioned that it was the mayor's idea. But did you go to him and say, I'll need X people and X dollars to get this moving? Or did you say, okay, and then figure out a way to handle it as you went along? Um, in the very beginning, yes. Yeah. So um, when, we, when, when as, as sort of the idea developed and I got on staff and I laid out w what my goals were and then the mayor and chief of staff laid out their goals, I said, there's no way I could do this alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and, and so they had already allocated one videographer and I was just like, you know what, 
if we can add like at least you know x amount of people um because it very quickly became a thing where it's just like oh one person or one and a half people are going to be doing this no like there's like you need a full newsroom staff or actually grow towards a full newsroom staff um, so then another question about uh, how you generate content. You spoke about not repurposing outside stories, but do you ever try and find a local connection or angle for stories that are in the national or international headlines? Yeah, sometimes we'll do that. Um, for example, we did, um, oh, when, uh, uh, and this is something that the city government was not expected to do, but we did it anyway. When the Academy Awards happened uh, a couple months ago, uh, Peter Farrelly, I believe, is that Farrelly brother. Uh, when he won the Oscar for Green Book, and he was going on and on and on his acceptance speech, and he was like, uh, oh, you got to go check out Detroit. You got to go check out Shinola Watches because they're saving Detroit. And to our knowledge, you know, there was no Shinola product placement in Green Book, which was a movie filmed in the 1960s when Shinola was still shoe polish and not watches. But you know, that, that tension between, you know, Shinola's perception of Detroit and, and Detroiters' perception of Detroit as far as Shinola saving the city when a city did not need to be saved. Um, that was an incident where I took uh, what Peter Farrelly said and I kind of like cleared the air and I said, you know, Detroit didn't need saving. Uh, you know, Shinola is certainly welcome here in Detroit. They're a very welcome presence. They put a lot of people to work. There's multiple things that are saving Detroit, uh, <laughs> if you want to even call it saving, and just kind of highlight it like all the different employers and all the different initiatives going on. That was something where we, we sort of seized a moment right there. Everybody was talking about it. And then we sort of, we actually were able to cut through the, the din of, 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 of that and make a declarative statement. Um, did not have to ask the mayor's permission. Uh, the mayor actually was surprised that I wrote it uh, and he read it alongside everybody else and um, it made a statement, so. Great. Um, interesting that you brought up the mayor's office. Do you report metrics to the council or the mayor's office? We do once a year during budget time, uh, report our metrics across every Thing that we do in, in our department and um, councils please uh, they've actually um, for the other the other side of the department we work with they've actually asked they're like you know it's, it's on tape so I can say this but like um, they're just like do you guys need more budget do you guys need more like we'll give it to you um, you know they're pleased with the work that we do um, our mayor is such a data and numbers guy and while he doesn't like you know knock on my door anything like that asking for the numbers I give them to them anyway and we grow month to month we actually hit a page view record uh, last month and we're on our way to another one uh, at, at the end of this month and um, now we're not um, I, I would say that our numbers are not a priority I do want to say that because there are so many other metrics in Detroit that we're analyzing home mortgages um, Nonviolent crimes, like all, all, you know, like like we're not up there with nonviolent crimes. Put it that way. So. Right. Um, then the, guys, the last question that's in chat and came in during the conversation, and then Amy will open it up for any questions that are uh, on people's minds on the line now. Um, what's next for the department? Do you see just a kind of a steady uptick, or is it repurposing? Not repurposing. Is there a refocus or anything like that, or is it just more of the same? I think two things are going to happen. Um, one, more community engagement. So we did um, a community pop-up uh, storytelling thing a couple of months ago, and it worked. It was I was surprised at how many people responded to it. We we um, took our audio setup and we took a photo setup uh, to a boutique on the west side of Detroit and just asked people to fall through and and, and tell your story. Um, and a lot of people did. And I was like, okay, we got to get back out there and do that again. Um, you know, the next step for us is community engagement as far as like really, really maybe doing like panel discussions or, or just, you know, getting outside of our, our city hall comfort zone a little bit more than we already do. Um, the other part of this is um, our arts and culture department at the city is finding its footing again. Uh, it was recently reestablished. And being that arts and culture it has been neglected at the city government level for so long, um, it's, it's got some renewed energy that will definitely align with what we're trying to do. Um, we want to be a place where you can learn more about the arts and you can dialogue with culture creators and whatnot. 
arts and culture department is going to be the liaison for that. So linking up, um, and it's a natural fit for media and art to kind of work together. So I think uh, our next step is going to be working more and more and more with our uh, newly hired uh, arts and culture director. So Great. All right. Well, it's a perfect uh, segue to some dialogue for anyone online who wants to throw a question out uh, live. Uh, everyone's lines should be open. So if you have a question, go ahead and fire away. They're all pondering. <laughs> this is Amy and uh, really been inter interested in all of the interchange. I'm not even answer asking a question live. I just um, want to let you know, typically webinar attendees do like to use the chat um, because sometimes we're in a noisy office, but um, the lines are unmuted now. And so if anyone wants to chime in, here's your chance. Greg, did we get to all the questions that were um, submitted through the registration process? Um, we did not. Um, Heather, do you have any of those maybe that we could maybe take a look at or follow up on? Well, I know one question was the difference between civic storytelling and corporate and kind of where's the intersection? Where would be the sweet spot for those of us that are not in a municipality? Mm -hmm. uh, some of those learnings that you've learned, and I know you're still kind of building a plane in the air. Yeah. Uh, but what can we take back immediately to our organizations? Um, the thing you can take, I mean, so for civic storytelling, uh, there's an end goal for us of, like I said, um, having a say in our own narrative that we haven't had a say in for so long and producing something out of that narrative, like I said, uh, producing investment, producing uh, a perception change, or just, or, or like I said, adding to, to residents feeling that they belong in Detroit. Um, it's one way to feel like you belong in Detroit because your trash is getting picked up on time. It's another, it's a completely different layer if, if you feel like you're belonging in Detroit because you actually see yourself um, in the city. So that's our end goal. I think the sweet spot for corporate is um, taking elements of that. Like, like I said, what, where, what is your narrative? And if your narrative is not where you want it to be, how do you produce something that um, your customers or client or whatever, uh, or a future customer, I guess, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, can, can, can point to and say like, okay, I am going to, 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 you know, to sidle up to this corporation or this company because of a story I or because of a narrative I saw about this, um, um, you know, organization. I think the other key takeaway is um, there, I mentioned very early on, you have your communications reps that, that go directly to the media. Um, anybody can make their own media now, thanks to, to um, you know, contracting with a videographer, um, contracting with a social media person or, or whatever. Um, having that hesitation to create something. Um, but I think also it has to not look like a commercial. It has to not look like an ad or, or something like that. Everybody has the capability to create and produce media. Is what kind of message are you trying to send with that, and how do you want it to be received? Hey, we did get a couple more questions in chat, so I'll go ahead and throw this one out to you. Have you ever had to say no to a special interest group due to a conflict of interest? Yes, we have. Um, <laughs> um, there's been a few times where. Um, you know, like it, it would clearly run into the line of advertising. And we always have to be careful with that because people have realized like, oh, the city does have these cable channels. Like, can we produce something or something like that? And we always have to run that through legal. And, and like, I, I've reached a point where it's just like, okay, unless it, it, I have to say no to some of these things because it's not authentic. And it also like, I don't, there's also the, the, the public perception of like, okay, um, obviously you need uh, some corporate investment in Detroit to kind of get things going, but like, we don't want to like, just get too, too, too buddy, buddy up with a lot of these places where it's not necessary, right? It's not necessary for, for it to be a bunch of like corporate placement on, 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 on the stories that we write or anything like that. So, um, that, yeah, so yeah, it, it has happened. It doesn't happen often, 
but I do get that a lot. And I'm just like, no, we just try to like go tell Detroit's story. Okay, so here's another question. Do you ever partner or collaborate with Windsor, which I assume is a neighboring locality? No, you know, um, but I mean, that's a good idea though. I mean. Although point of clarification, yeah. Windsor is actually in another country. Yeah, that's so, Canada. Uh, okay. <laughs> They've got a whole different kind of like way of doing governance there. Um, but it, I mean, it's a good idea. I mean, we get, I get the question of, you know, how come we don't talk about Highland Park and Hamtramck, which for people who don't know, if you look at a map of Detroit, there's two big empty spaces. That's because there are two cities within the city of Detroit uh, that have the completely separate uh, city hall infrastructure and all of that. They're just surrounded by all four borders, each city uh, in the city. And people are just like, well, they're inside Detroit. And I'm like, they're not Detroit. But um, no, I mean, no, we haven't done anything with Windsor or any other city. That said, I mean, we're still new at this. Um, I know the city of Troy, uh, which is a suburb uh, north of Detroit, is kind of halfway exploring what we do. And there could be that, like, this is so new, like, there's nothing that, that um, couldn't happen down the line uh, that we can explore. So. All right, so here's a, here's a comment that came in, not necessarily a question, but I want to share it. It sounds very much like your work is civic engagement and we're focused, focused on employee engagement. A big part of your job is to make your residents take pride in their city and bravo. Yep, that's, um, that's exactly what I want people to feel when, when, they, when they read or, or see something. It's like, okay, if I have this pride in my city, I'm going to stay in the city. I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell a friend about this city. Um, for a very long time, uh, a lot of people were on the bubble, were on the fence about leaving Detroit, and just were, you know, not seeing what they wanted to see. Um, on the corporate level, uh, if your narrative is such that that people don't feel proud proud to work there, who are your ambassadors that can say? Um, I, I like working here. I've had a good experience with this company. I would work with this company again. That's where you can incorporate storytelling into the brand. Great. Um, I just also, the last comment I got was uh, great storytelling, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go ahead and just uh, wrap it up now. It's been great talking with you, but it's time to wrap up the conversation. Thank you, Heather and Aaron, for being with us today. Thanks so much. I want to remind everyone on the, on the call that our next monthly webinar will take place on Wednesday, July 17th. Kurt Dudley, Director of Broadcast Services at James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, will share his insights on communicating effectively to multiple audiences across multiple platforms. As we close, we want to make sure you're aware of a few things. First, please complete the participant survey. It will open as you exit. If you have questions about today's webinar or the IABC Heritage Region, email communication at iabcheritage.com. Feel free to connect with Aaron directly at aaronkfoley at gmail.com or on Twitter at Aaron K. Foley. To learn about IABC membership benefits, go to iabc.com slash membership. And a special thanks to Gary Spondike at Pitch Black Media for allowing us the use of his studio for this program. Thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.